So hi everyone, uh, good evening, and I guess good morning and good afternoon, depending on your location. My name is Wittawat, and we are the co-organizers of the workshop on machine learning in Thailand, MIT. We are Patalawat, Wittawat, myself, Sampalit, Kokgao, Titipat, Kraikamon. Uh, we would like to welcome you to the workshop on machine learning in Thailand. Um, so we have prepared an exciting program for you uh, today uh, for the next three hours. But before we get into the core program of the workshop, I would like to spend just a few minutes telling you why we decided to come up with or decided to organize this workshop in the first place. Okay, so, so it all started from our observation here that in fact, Thailand has quite diverse groups of interests on topics directly related to machine learning or indirectly related to machine learning. So here are Facebook groups that you, I guess many of you are familiar with. So the first one here is Thai NLP, Thai Natural Language Processing. We have a CoLab Thailand Facebook group, we have PyTorch Thailand, we have Keras and Kaggle Competition group. We have groups related to data science we also have Thailand's machine learning research group. So each of these that you see here, each of these groups has at least 5,000 members. So in terms of like the growth rate and in terms of number of people interested in machine learning, um, I think we are in the right direction. So it's, we are growing. But then the thing is that, um, the thing is that I think the overall community, the overall machine learning community in Thailand is somewhat fragmented. And by fragmented, I mean um, the interaction across different groups that I just told you um, is not sufficient. So I, we think that there should be more interaction across groups that I just told you. So for example, we have newcomers, we have students who try to uh, start working on machine learning and they don't know where to go and what to read. We have researchers from academia and practitioners from industry. Um, they do interact, but we think that the interaction between the two is not sufficient at this level. Um, there are also, I guess, policymakers. We have, we have people working on political sciences, social sciences. Um, so these people, um, they ask questions that we technical people may not ask. For example, they ask things like, um, I guess, like, um, is the decision made by machine learning models fair to people? It's like a fairness issue. They ask questions like, um, does machine learning preserve users' privacy? It's a privacy issue. So this kind of question we rarely address like as technical researchers, but they are all important questions. And I guess different groups should interact so that everybody gets to see all aspects of machine learning. So that's the first shortcoming that we noticed, fragment the community. And the second uh, shortcoming would be, um, we think that our community is underrepresented in the global machine learning community at this point. Um, judging from say the number of papers, art, uh, research articles submitted per year uh, to machine learning journals and conferences, I guess we estimate that we have less than 100 papers from Thailand submitted to any big venues and, and I think we should we should drive this number up we should, we should try to increase this number increase the engagement in the global machine learning community okay so that is why we decided to organize this workshop and uh, we have three goals but the primary goal is to connect these diverse groups of machine learning researchers and practitioners in Thailand that's sort of one aspect. So when we say in Thailand, we actually include um, neighboring countries and people working on any topics, but related or, or can be applied to Thailand. It doesn't, so we don't just include only Thai people. We try to be inclusive. We, we, we welcome uh, people from neighboring countries, people from uh, elsewhere who work on any topics that can be applied to problems in Thailand. So we try to connect uh, people. And the second goal that we want is to discuss current state of machine learning advances um, that are related to Thailand. And as you will see today in the next, um, I guess, two and a half hours, 
uh, we have nine invite. Uh, we have nine speakers um, to tell you about interesting machine learning topics um, in Thailand, and we have one invited speaker as well. So third goal is to lower the barrier and improve diversity in Thai machine learning community. Um, so by providing this workshop as a platform or as a venue for people to join and speak, we essentially lower the barrier, the entry barrier to uh, machine learning community. Okay, so here's the agenda for today. Um, so after this opening, we will have four, I guess five, oh, sorry, one, sorry, starting with the invited speaker. And then after that, we have four contributed talks from authors. And then we have a break at 740. And this is Thailand's time. And after that, we have five more contributed talks. And then um, at the end, we will have a short speed dating program, our social program, where um, this is for Zoom participants only. So this talk is currently being live streamed to Facebook as well. Uh, if you want, if you would like to join, please come over to the Zoom session. So by speed dating, we mean all you need to do is you don't need to do anything. You just stay in this session and you will be split randomly into small rooms so that you can interact with in a small group. And after a few minutes, you might be shuffled to meet new people. Okay. And keep in mind, uh, I know that most people here are Thai. You can speak Thai, but we... Um, please make sure to be inclusive and um, make sure that everybody in your room can understand Thai, if not speak to English. Okay. Um, and okay, yep. So we will have speed dating and everybody will be brought back to the main session again and then we will conclude the workshop. Okay. So I hope you can enjoy this workshop. But so just a few tips toward an inclusive and interactive workshop, right? So if you have any questions, please text. If you are on this Zoom session, you can just type your question in the chat and then our moderator will ask the speaker for you. If you're watching from Facebook, just you can also just type your question on Facebook and then um, one of us will check and then ask the speaker for you. Now, if you're on Zoom and you want to, if you have a good reason, you want to ask the speaker by yourself, you can just tap with this ad on stage so that we know that you want to ask by yourself and then we will invite you to, to ask the speaker at the end of the talk, okay? Um, and lastly, um, please feel free to share anything, um, papers, content. Yeah. Oh, there was something. Yeah, oh, anyway, so um, please feel free to share any papers or content so that people can follow. Um, people can follow up on the discussion via chat. Uh, could be here on Zoom or Facebook or elsewhere, actually, in fact. Please feel free to tweet, for example. So without further ado, I will pass on to Greg Amon, who will start the next session. Uh, Greg Amon, please. Hello. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much, Vito. Um, so it's, it's my pleasure to be able to introduce our invited speaker uh, for this workshop. Um, our invited speaker is Dr. Quan Chihua Tang Tai. So she is a computer scientist by training and she earned her PhD in the application of computer lit reading from University of East Anglia from uh, United Kingdom. And her PhD study was supported by the Royal Thai Government Scholarship as well. And before, before uh, conducting her PhD, she got a bachelor degree from computer science from Narayson University, Thailand. Um, her, doct her, her doctoral thesis won a prize award by the National Research Council of Thailand in 2020. Um, she has joined NECTEX, which is a research institute um, uh, in Thailand since 2007, where she involved in several research projects, including Thai speech recognition, speech to speech translation and pronunciation assessment. Um, so we can say that she is a, a, a world expert in, in Thai speech uh, processing. 
Uh, she has a long term interest in, in building a robust speech recognizer using acoustic and visual speech signal. And, and today she's going to uh, talk about one of her recent projects uh, that she has been working on for, for quite some time. So the stage is yours, Dr. Kwanchiwa. So it seems that we cannot hear you. Um, maybe it's the problem with your, your microphone. Mm. No, we cannot hear you. Is it related to what you just clicked? You, you just clicked to share the sound on your computer, but now your microphone stopped working. <laughs> Is it related to that? Because we will just test it. Can you still? Um. Mm, no, we cannot hear you. So what, one thing we can try is maybe you can, I guess, reconnect. I don't know if that yep. will yeah. do anything, but we can try. Hello. Okay, Hello. now it's yeah, the sound is yeah. fine, but at the screen, I'm not sure. Yeah, <laughs> now now perhaps you cannot show us the this generated voice that you. Okay. Yeah. Yes. สวัสดีค่ะจิบจิบยินดีให้บริการนะคะ Yeah, and how about my how about yep, my perfect microphone? yes good okay, perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. okay the stage is your oh sorry for a technical issue okay um my name is konjiwa dangtai today i'm going to talk about the the recent projects about virtual assistant and uh, avatar but this is just the first step so it's not much going into um deep machine learning things like that so first um I'm from Speech and Tech Understanding Laboratory at NECTEX. Um, and this work is come from my group, not just only me. So first I want, would like to, to talk about the challenge that we found uh, recently, like last year, we tried to build the virtual assistant and avatar and we 
we felt that we have a challenge that's related to to speech, just uh, speech to text and text to speech and speech animation. So are I going to talk about just things like that, not um, include about a uh, chatbot, anything like that, because it's not um, it's not related to to my um, my specific knowledge and understanding. So um, first, I show you about our first mockup. Here, we want to build the virtual assistant that have uh, avatar that people can talk to her, and you can see her uh, look really like a, a human. But the first mockup is just like this. So, oops, sorry. We just put the live movement into a standy and then um, generate a video file from um, put together the sound that generates from our space synthesizer and put them together. And this is just a mock up and show to everyone that we want to build this thing. Um, the real challenge that we found on the space to text or speech recognition system. So we, we want to deploy uh, our, our system. So it's called party speech recognizer. But in the real, real world system, what we need is not only the, the model that we have. So we train our model on the, uh, our in-house data set is quite large. But um, the data that we used in order to record the, the data is the near field. So that means we cannot handle the, the far field industry. Like if we, if we want to de deploy that model in a robot, we got low accuracy. Even mid field, like um, less than three meters from the, from the speaker or from the microphone, we really get a problem on that. Another thing is that uh, speech compression, we um, always record the data set in the um, lossless compression like a web file. But in the real data that come to our system is not that lossless data. It's contained like lossy MP3, MP, MPEG4. So thing like that, we need to handle that. that um, the, our system show that is really cannot handle that at, at the moment. So that two things um, together, now we try to use just the step core data augmentation to, to reproduce our acoustic model to handle that one. But um, another thing we have to do more to, to, to increase our accuracy. Another thing we found that the interaction type of the data of the, of the, the user is really different. Like a uh, voice command, voice search, and dictation, we can somehow handle it. Like we get very good accuracy on that. But um, we got uh, the request, like want to transcribe a YouTube video, um, the phone call, that is another story, and presentation like a lecture, things like that. And another, the, the last thing is that is very difficult is the discussion mean, I mean, that is a meeting. If you want to transcribe a meeting, it's really difficult because it's contained very natural speaking. You, you know, you don't talk to system, you talk to, to each other, you talk to one another and you, you have to somehow uh, rep repeat yourself like like me i'm got stuck when I'm, I'm thinking to speak something so we have we need another model to to handle that to make the accuracy better so this is a speech to take issue that we found next um is it the challenge about text to speech system and speech animation this is a new thing for art we just create new data set for this project. So I'm gonna talk about that. So we have the new data set called Tracing 3 Mitty that we got the audio visual data set from file data instead of recording it because uh, this data contains um, the face and the, the people that speak on this is really natural. 
So we we asked Kunkiti to 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 share this with us already, and this the the data is look what is look like you can see on the right hand side. So we have the audio data here, and we transcribe it, and then we align it into the phonemes. Um, we match it into the the Kunkiti face, extract visual feature. Ex, uh, extract visual feature and then reproduce that visual feature into uh, our 3D model. And this is some statistic of our tracing tree data set. We, uh, we present this um, data in the conference called Oriental Cocosta this year, maybe two weeks ago. This data set is quite larger than teasing one and two, so it may be appropriate for deep learning to learn the, the to learn the larger data from one speaker. And the uh, size of the size of data number of utterance is faced a lot larger. So you you you're gonna get something better. Even you just use your your normal. We we already use the the uh, HG Demakov model on teasing one and two, and we got different thing from teasing three on the Hidemakov model. It's just the, the model that is not deep learning yet. It's just the mean and variance, thing like that. But the size of data make us got a lot better result. And to build this, um, you can simply collect the YouTube video and we, because this program has um, many things inside the program, we track only Kunkiti phase using um, phase detection module from uh, uh, OpenCV. And then we transcribe the, the video, only the data that contain Kunkiti phase uh, by human. And after that, we have to clean the audio and visual data because if somehow out of sync, we have to collect them. And then the data itself is not really clean. So we have to like um, noise, using noise reduction process to, to clean the data. We then uh, extract visual features and then do the phone alignment on that data. And this one on the left hand, uh, on the right hand side show you the, our our first uh, audio visual uh, space synthesizer. I'm sorry, it's very difficult to. So what you have Niku Villa Kao Hong Tan Kap Kao Samiti, Public Hat Samodi, Tisip Kanya Yon Nakap Kao Samiti, Yang Hong got it. This is another issue that I, I cannot I cannot send the the video file into into that meeting because it's it lack of the so what you have need to relax how uh, let me try to go back to this again so what you have need to relax how long time to come out some of the public has somebody i can share you your life how some of the young home got it for long jack and how long can sounds and i'm put on a wrong way and i have tea time hey poor okay the sound itself you you can see that it's really different from from what I say on the on the mock up. It's really natural uh, because we train on the larger data, and we found that the the chunk like the duration between between each word and each syllable have different from the from what we had what we had trained on teasing one and two. So even it's just the HMM model you 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 still need um have to cl uh, collect enough data to to train like a duration model I think so I have a have a quick question maybe um okay. so the sound you just play is so it's all synthesized so, right, so this, yes. this is yeah, synthesized from yes, the model the sound okay okay So it's, it's quite impressive that it's, it's sound like Kun Kitty. <laughs> and like it's, it's just a, a, the, the old old fashioned HMM model. So if you you stay in the space synthesizer, you're gonna get like a new 
fancy model, but but this is the side of data. Yeah. Okay, so let's go to another thing that we have done on this project. So the just the face and the mouse movement is not enough to convey the message. So instead of using just that face, we we decide to enter into into a gesture generation challenge this year. So it called Genia Workshop 2020. And this is what we have done. I think they used to drop me to this like crash or something like that, but for whatever reason, like they were like that didn't work out or there's something like that. I don't. Uh, this is from our model, but um, it's not perfect yet, but I think it's something, it's something different from just the mouse and head movement. So I'm going to talk more about this. So next time I enter into this genius challenge this year, we have like just 15 days to train the model, design everything, and then test on just two, two or three times, test the, the model and then deploy it. So first we put together the speech and text uh, information, extract the feature from that, and then we do the encoder, decoder, uh, long short term memory, bidirectional long short term memory model. Uh, we generate the output vector here, and then we have to decode the gesture back into the, the, the 3D model. And this is our input. So the speech here is about 30 dimension and text. We put text together with speech. So the text here is about 100 dimension to train the system. And this is about the uh, out, output feature extraction. Instead of using the direct uh, motion capture data, uh, we found uh, a paper that suggests we should use something like uh, denoising autoencoder to, to learn the representation and then use it as a, as a, a vector instead of the just 15 joint together. So we got very good re result on this as well. Um, this is a, the, the final result um, from, the, from the challenge. So uh, they measure the appropriate of the, of the result. I mean, uh, they ask some people to score if they, if they think the uh, the speech and the uh, the movement is is appropriate or not. So this one is the natural, the the real data. So the real data is got yeah is you it usually got high score on appropriate net and human like net is like uh, they ask just only uh, they ask people to score only when they see the the gesture without the sound. So this one is got high on both appropriate net and a human like. And another thing they do something like mis mismatch. So they put together the, the speech sound and different gesture together and then play to, to people. Appropriate net is a lot lower, but the human like net is still high. And on this, you can see that um, uh, they, they buy the, the organization, but SE here is our system. We got, uh, we're not that bad on the appropriate net. I think we, we're not the, the lowest one, but human likeness is really not that high. So we're gonna show you the, the result. Oh, before that, um, I, I'm, I'm showing you the oh, natural. Like, oh, okay. Well, okay, whatever. And I did like, I was just like, why did she, why, why? Why have you done this to me? This is what the data look like uh, on the natural way and the, the mismatch one. Like, oh, okay. Well, okay, whatever. And I got like, I was just like, why did she, why, why, why have you done this to me? Yeah, it's, yeah, you can see that it is not really related to what they say. Uh, another one. Okay. I think they used to drop me to this like, crash or something like that, one. but for whatever reason, like they were like, that didn't work out or there's something like that. I don't, I think they used to drop me and to this like crash or something like that, but for whatever reason, like they were like, that didn't work out or there's something like that. Somehow I don't, it's difficult to, to distinguish between those two. And this is our system here. 
and then the result. I think they used to drop me to this like crash or something like that, but for whatever reason, like they were, like that didn't work out, or there's something like that. I don't. I think it's not that bad, but yeah, <laughs> but um, so the appropriate net one is is all right, but a human doesn't like really like it. And uh, I'll show you another system here. SD, I don't know who they got a higher score on both sides than us. So let's see. I think they used to drop me to this like crash or something like that, but for whatever reason, like they were, like that didn't work out or there's something like that. I don't. What a different, I think um, they have like a hair shake, something that we don't have. Okay, so <laughs> this um, last two slides of my talk. Um, I'm, I can show you the current state that of this avatar that we built is not that. Um, so first we don't uh, use the complex machine learning or the movement that we generate in this data yet. It's just the somehow pre-script on the movement, but the sounds and the lift shapes, lift shape is still the baseline system uh, um, I can show you here. สวัสดีครับยินดีต้อนรับเข้าสู่รายการข่าวของท่านพบกับผมกิตติเอไอที่นี่เร็วๆนี้นะครับ Because the network, I, I think I cannot send that um, video, the movement in video. Uh, let me. So I think I think the problem I think the problem is the frame rate of the of Zoom. Okay. Um, okay. So probably. So is it possible for you to share the slide or maybe the video uh, yeah, later yeah, yeah, after yeah, the talk? I, yeah. I can, so that the, the participant can have a look later. And I also want yeah. to say that we, we only have one minute left. So maybe you want okay. to. Video, okay. I know. Uh, yeah. The last one. So what do you do? So, um, because I, I cannot send the video. Um, if you can see, uh, you, you're gonna get, you're gonna have um, the, the idea that what it need to, to, to improve. Um, we do something like um, uh, emotion on the, day, on, on the face, but it still look weird. And we have to at least increase that. And another thing is, um, because we, we don't have the, the actual movement now. So we, we have to do another day that I think maybe TED Talk is a good thing uh, to train the model in time and then put it into that um, avatar. And maybe that, oh, thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much for wonderful talk. So I think we have only one or two minutes for, for question. Um, and I think there's some question in the chat that people ask. So I think the, the first question that I maybe I, I want to ask uh, on behalf of uh, uh, Charin is, uh, will part of this project or the data set be open source or is there any timeline on that? Um, I, I, I know everyone want to use them. Uh, actually, we, we try to ask Kunkiti about that and we try to think how to how to distribute this data, but he still have uh, some concern on that. But one thing we, uh, I think, if if we part to that concern, we still have to protect his uh, identity. I mean, if some of you can change his his voice into into the thing that 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 difference from from his style, it can be, it can be, maybe we can ask him again. And uh, on the visual data, instead of sharing the video, we can we can at least share the features. Maybe it can help you to to build something up on that. I think. Okay, thank that you. So and the question? Yeah, I think I think that's answered the question. So I think there's a lot of uh, a factor to consider because it's involved uh, uh, human being and and privacy concern, I guess. Yes. Um. So. Okay, Pon Pawit. Um, so I will let you ask the question on stage. Um, can you unmute yourself and then? All right. Uh, I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. All right. I'm sorry. Actually, I I didn't really understand like the entire flow 
but there was well, like one slide that showed the the, the head movement that's mapped to um to the 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 pictures. Mm -hmm. Is that what it is? I, I'm not sure how how that's uh, related to like um the the voice uh like how 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 it plays a part in like the entire uh building of the model. Because mm -hmm. I I'm pretty sure that like this is just like that's that was just like one small part in like the entire model. So mm -hmm. I didn't really understand how it like factor in, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I, I understand your question right. So you ask that like uh the head movement is that the head movement related to our pre uh, current model? Is that right? Yeah, right, no? right. Yeah. Okay. Um so I, I can I can share to you that now the the um the the movement of the of the current model is prescripting, which means we do, uh, we we ask someone we ask uh, the artist to do the uh, we call action, and then we we put that action together with the mouth movement now. Because we don't have the the data that uh, contain the the movement of body, so if we if we can train that in in Thai, I think uh, we can put that gesture generation into the model instead of using pre-scripting. Oh, I see. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that, that that answers my question. Okay. Right. Thank you. Okay, so I think there's a lot more question, but I think in the interest of time, I would probably uh, uh, stop the, the Q and A session here. And okay. I would like to, to thank our invited speaker again. Um, and I think um, if anyone has a further question about the project or what she talked about today, I guess it's, it's possible for, for them to, to reach out to you. Is that correct? What would be the, yes, the best yeah. way to, to, to contact uh, you? Okay, so then. Um, so, uh, thank you so much, uh, Kwan Shiva and uh, Pete Krikamon. So, my name is Sidipat, and I'll be your moderator for the first session. Uh, our next session is a list of contributed talks. Uh, we have four contributed talks followed by the break. Uh, we are around 10 minutes break. So we probably have everything shift for 10 minutes. Uh, each presenter will present for seven minutes followed by three minutes of question. Uh, I would like to remind you also that you can ask question anytime on Zoom or Facebook Live. Uh, and please tag on stage if you want to ask the question uh, with, uh, with the speaker yourself. So uh, for the first talk, uh, uh, this is for people who are in, interested in reinforcement learning and also board games. Uh, I would like to introduce our first contributed speaker, Natapon Hongjeren. He is going to talk about transferable, transferable reinforcement learning for board games. Uh, please welcome Natapon. I'm not sure if Natapon is here. Um, okay. Okay. Hello. Can All right. Me? We can hear you. Awesome. Uh, how do I share my screen? Uh, it's the bar below and then in the middle, you can share your screen. All right, we can see your slides. Yeah, uh, please welcome Natsapon. Is it, is it the correct slide or is it? Yeah, we can see your slides. You can see my mouse, right? Yes, we can okay. see your mouse too. Okay, good evening. My name is Natsapon Hong Jaren. So today I am going to talk about my bachelor thesis. It's called transferable reinforcement learning for board game. There are a lot of 
reinforcement learning applications that you know playing games and we are very good at it for example AlphaGo everyone know about this and then open ai5 this play Dota 2 and this actually uh what should it say proof that the agent, the reinforcement agent, can cooperate with each other, and then Alpha Star, this play Starcraft, this proof that a reinforcement agent can, you know, micromanage multiple things at the same time. But the problem about reinforcement learning is it needs a lot of resource. For example, Alpha Zero, this mine is with 5,000 TPU. This is uh, this to generate the self play game and then train the network with another 64 GPU, which is a lot. To put it sim more simple, Alpha Go Zero would take around 1700 years to train with a PC, and this PC actually it takes 1080 ti which is not a cheap pc at all so this makes it very difficult to you know reproduce a uh, reinforcement learning research for an individual researcher but then i think about in computer vision usually not train just train everything from the crash by just random the weight and say if that model will do good or something like that we usually use the image net model or some some big data set like ms coco or something use the already trained model and then change the output layers and train with our data set even though our data set like this it is a medical image, which is not really related to the image. It's usually better to transfer. It would be something like better convergence or good overall accuracy, something like that. And with that in mind, Alpha Zero itself, the deep neural network part is just a ResNet, ResNet with some more output layers. So it shouldn't be that difficult to just, you know, remove this layer from a model that already trained to play a chess and then train it to play shaker. This should be faster than just make the model train, uh, learn to play shaker from the start. So that was my idea. And also people who are good at board games like Checker or Chess, usually they also go at another board games as well. So it should be possible that we can make two models with two set of input and output, and then have some part of the model be the same, share the weight, and then train them simultaneously. This should work too. So that was my idea. And then the problem is chess. It needs a lot of time. This is this graph is from Alpha Zero paper that they train chess. They train the Alpha Zero train allows seven hundred thousand steps, but the first hundred thousand steps on K80 servers would take around 10, hey, 1,000 years. Even though something around this place where it's somehow usable, it still takes a lot of time, which is impossible for that. So I need to change the game to something simpler, like Otelo and this Connect4. I choose Otelo instead of Checker because checker is like chess where you need to pick a piece on the board and then place it somewhere. 
rather than Othello or Connecto or go that you just pick a place in the board and be done with it. So I think Othello should be learn the model should be able to learn Othello faster than Shaker. And Connect4 is very simple. It's actually a soft game. So this should be a good game to have it play first and then learn Othello later. That was the idea. So, but because of the time limit and I don't have that much resource in the first place. So compared to the original or fast and low in the bracket, I said only 500 game per step. The step is like have the model play 500 games and then use, use that data to train the model. And that is one step. Then we compared to the previous model that is it actually better if the winning rate is 55% or more then it's better than we keep the new model if it's not then we just keep the old model and the problem is I can only say it for 50 steps this 50 steps takes me like 300 hours with a KAT CPU and that's a lot so I can really use 50 steps but compared to the alpha zero that use 700,000 and this could be the problem because the end result the model that trained from the crash actually better than the transfer model this particular model that trained from the crash is Actually, one against human, like almost 100% against human with me and my friends who well, I have them try it. This model is better, but the transfer model is not that great. Also, the model that use the shared, some part of the shared way, it's better than the transfer, but still worse than the model that train from the crash. So this makes me think maybe this I, I trade it to few steps or maybe I didn't have enough exploration. Exploration is like have the model try new things and then see if it's good. But trying too much a lot of new things will make it just you know slow to learn. So I didn't try that. And of course, I only train for 50 steps, so maybe that's also the reason, but I don't know. Yeah, I'm sorry for interrupting Metapon. Uh, I think we have to end here. Yeah, uh, because we actually run end here. Oh, <laughs> all right, thank you. So thank you. Uh, everyone, you can put uh, clapping emojis or um, any emojis if you like the talk. So. Um, I don't see any questions, but um, I feel like we are watching Queen's Gambit on net Netflix for, for your talk. Um, so uh, I have one question actually. Uh, did you compare the win rate for uh, comparing the, the black one with the white one? Basically, who uh, is the win rate for your bot is higher if uh, the bot move first, for example? Yes. The the one that moved first actually higher rate, but I compare them hundred games for both sides. So I swap the side. Yes, but from statistically, the the side that moved first usually win. I see. And then uh, we have one one more questions and then we, we we might have to move to another speaker so the next question from zoom is what are the numbers in the tables represent again so in uh these two are number of the game played and win yeah i see i see and this mctf team is like how many time we search for a move like it's like three search, you know, we first then oh, how many move ahead is probably like that. So this is uh, 
only five, something like five move ahead. That we, uh, the model will think of and then pick a move. And this is 25 move ahead, but they both do the same thing. So it's just that this one, this will be better, but this faster. That's it. Got and it. for so this, it's for different version. Okay. Compare between different version. This is the best version for and this, is the, this is the second best version. Yeah. Got it. So uh, we might have to end here. Thank you so much, Natapon, for the talk. Uh, if you guys have any questions, please follow up on Facebook Live or Zoom, and then Natapon can answer your question. So for the next talk, uh, I would like to introduce our speaker, Karakot Chavavanich. He is a research scientist uh, at WISTEC and formerly at um, NECTEC and also through Digital Corporation. He involves in many open source projects such as DeepCut and also PyTai NLP and also open communities that you guys know, Colab and, and also Thai National Language Processing. Uh, today, he is going to talk about how to improve Google Collaboratory to serve Thailand machine learning community. Uh, please welcome Karakot. Thank you. Okay, so you can see me. Uh, uh, you can see my slide, right? Can you? Can you slide? Uh, so I, the slide can be downloaded from bit.ly acm dash cora. Uh, I am now at Wistech in the, I wish uh, is created, uh, no, I mean the AI Research Institute, uh, there's a collaboration between Wistech and Deepak is created to, uh, for, to distribute the AI knowledge and uh, especially data set. And my work here is, uh, is uh, how to improve Google Collab so that it can serve the same objective that uh, our institute uh, aim to do. Okay, the outline is that I talk about quickly about what is Google Collab and its features and limitations and uh, how my library Cora add new features and some of the sound and the future plan. Uh, Google Collab or Google Collaboratory is, uh, is a notebook environment. Uh, it's a Jupyter notebook that uh, you can run Python and it's cloud-based so you can run it from anywhere. It doesn't depend on installing on your machine. It's good for exploring data and for creating models uh, as a education platform. And it's actually run on Google Cloud. The, the, uh, the spec is that it's uh, actually GCP N1 high mem 2. So it had a lot of memory uh, comparatively, uh, which is 13 gigabyte. And if you buy Colab Pro, you will get 25 gigabyte. Add it will be 100 gigabyte. And if we collect Pro, you double it. GPU, the, the latest best GPU is V100, which is, is okay, can train a lot of things for education. We, it had Python 3.6 and a lot of library. It had TensorFlow, PyTorch, and even Fast AI. And the best feature is that it integrates with Google Drive. You can save it on your Google Drive and you can share it uh, to your friend easily, like you share Google document. Uh, so it's quite become, it's become, it has become popular for sharing knowledge in machine learning. Both the two popular framework, which is TensorFlow 2 and PyTorch, they document, they use Google Collab to, to let people learn how to use this framework. And a lot of research now are shared with Google Collab as well. So you, the first choice for them, for most people, they, you can just use Google Collab. Otherwise, you can go and view source or, and, or download notebook. So these are second and third choice for both uh, TensorFlow and PyTorch. So that's how popular it is with machine learning. And uh, although it has a lot of features, it has some limitations. First, there's some hard to install libraries uh, a few libraries are, are very hard. Sometimes you need to install Honda or sometimes you need Python 3.8 or something that are, that those are difficult to install. 
some missing functionality. Some might ask how to record audio or video, but it's, it's, not, it's not there and you need to add it yourself. And especially it's, it, it, it doesn't generate a lot of money. So they don't spend a lot of engineering work, uh, workforce. So, so they don't accept, they, can, they say they cannot have the result to review your contribution. So they just don't accept your contribution. If you want something, you might ask them. And if it is in their schedules, maybe like uh, eight months later, they add that feature. I, I request a few features and it takes about almost a year for those features to come to fruition. Uh, so with these limitations in mind, uh, some, some, there's some requests from community, like uh, they thank me for adding Thai font, uh, Ajahn Sheikh. Thank me for adding Typhoon to Google Collab easily. Uh, and this, this kind of, there are some of the kind of requests. So I, I think maybe I should make it even easier and add more features to Google Collab. That's why I create uh, Cora library that you can just install Cora and anything I want or anything you want and you tell me I can add it. So Collab, Google Collab will have that feature after you install Cora. So what? What are the current features? Uh, the current features, uh, there are a lot of Cora.install. You can install a lot of server, Elasticsearch, MongoDB, MySQL, Microsoft, uh, SEL server, PostgreSQL, Python, and a lot of uh, things that someone asked somewhere and I put it there. You can download some data set, Thai data set like this, or Kit, Lotus, Tsing one and Tsing two, and even in the future, probably Tsing T when they take uh, distribute that, and it also have paper with code uh, like, uh, about how the research is going on in the AI world, and for visualization, it has some uh, word cloud and bar chart racing, and a lot of it, and let, uh, lately I have just add, added a few of the easy, uh, just easy to use AI few color. Uh, black and white image into color image or turn a 2D image into 3D. And this morning I just add the translation from English to Thai. So it's, it's not hard when, and a lot of other features. So that's too, too many to, to list here. So I just uh, chose some of it. To install Thai font, you just uh, import MPL, which is my potlib, and then call add Thai font or you can add font and given it an, a, your URL for that font and set the size of the font. And now that when you plot it, you can see the Thai character display correctly. For text editor, Collab doesn't have text editor. It, it actually has one, but it's hidden. You don't know how to call it. So I create this edit magic that you can have your text editor on a new pane with a few tabs. You even have tab for different file that you can edit simultaneously. Uh, some text editor and console. Collab doesn't have a uh, command line console. You, you can call one line or two line of command, but you don't have this full feature uh, console. So I add it so that you can use it easily. Uh, some data set like this uh, machine learning, uh, no machine translation data set that uh, our AI research just distributed a few months ago. Uh, visualization, this one plot the word cloud, which is, I think the one that, probably the only one that's interactive because you can mouse over and it had some uh, two tip that show more data. You can set this kind of data. And if you don't like, you can, it, these are open source. You can look at the code on how does it is implemented. And lastly, this AI from Corada, I import colorizer and then you just colorizer, open that black and white image and it just return a new color image. Uh, for the future, uh, for the result now, it has almost a, a thousand download per week, but this week it has uh, 700, so it re reduced a bit. But uh, on the last, it's, it's, uh, uh, the trend is increasing because uh, people, when they install Cora, they need to install it again every day because uh, Google Collab will list it. So, so there's some new download almost uh, every day. Uh, and uh, although I'm not promoting a lot, but, but that, that somehow is, uh, the, the growth is, is quite, quite good. Uh, 
For future plan, I will add more features by request. So if you have any request, you can tell me or you can post it in Collab Thailand. And Cora.ai will grow with more open source research like Facebook or any anywhere that open, uh, that open source and I find it interesting or someone else find it interesting and request me, I will add that to Cora.ai so that you can have a one or two line command that do anything you want. And for data set, we'll grow with more open data sets. And I hope, and I will promote this for use in more school and university. And that's the end of my presentation. All right, thank you so much, Karakot. And uh, uh, if you have, if you like the talk, please do a clapping hands uh, for the reactions. Uh, we have a few questions from the audience in Zoom. So uh, the first one is that, uh, is Cora coming from Coracot? Uh, I, I want to use Colab, but Colab, Colab is gone. So I, I find some word that is similar. So Cola can be, can be a part of me, Cola, or you can potentially say it's Corac, Corac. That's how <laughs> you might. All right. <laughs> and for the logo, you have a Cola. So I, it have a lot of uh, layer of meaning. So. I All love right. this type of ambiguity. Yes. I see. And then for the second question, uh, so uh, this is from ABC um, in Zoom. So he or she uh, asks that, do you think it, it is dangerous to tie this to some platform you don't have to control off? Like Google just start charging for more storage. So basically uh, he asks, uh, so a lot of features here are collab related. Do you think it's dangerous to tie this in some platform you don't have any control of? Uh, and then yes, it's, it might be. Uh, I, I I think that collab is quite uh, sustainable in that as long as it help Google sell TensorFlow and and Google Cloud, they can give for collab for free, and they have been giving it for free for for three years. And now it have even two platform. It have Kaggle and collab. Both are very similar and both belong to Google. I don't think they will just turn off both of them. If they turn off Collab and they check, they use Kaggle, I will migrate this to Kaggle. Got it, got it. Uh, and the, the last one, uh, the quick one. So basically, do you have any suggestion if I would like to run a model for a long time? Uh, it's better that you buy the Google Collab Pro. It, it will give you 24 hours. And you can t turn the screen on, and there's a script that keep clicking refresh for every minute. And if it it, it you have twenty four hours, so you can come and check at the same time every evening, and then restart. Uh, another technique is that you you save the the training result, the checkpoint in your Google Drive every hour or every epoch. That can help you when it somehow reset. That's all the the tips I have. Got it. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, if you have more questions, uh, please ask below and then Karakot can answer for you. So thank you so much, Karakot, again for the talk. For the next talk, if you are interested in machine learning research and also medical imaging, this talk is definitely for you. Our fourth contributor speaker is Konpat Prishikun. He is doing uh, the research under the supervision of Professor Ekapon, which may many people know. He is going to talk about how to use deep learning for X-ray image localization. Uh, please welcome Konpat. Thank you. So our fourth speaker is Dr. Tiparat Chotibut. He is now a faculty member at um, the Department of Physics at Chulalongkorn University. His research lies on the interface among computer science, physics, and biology. Today, he is going to talk about how to use methods of theoretical physics to demystify machine learning algorithms. Uh, please welcome Dr. Tiparat. Hello, I'm trying to share my screen, but somehow it cannot be seen yet, I guess. All right, let me see. Okay, we can see your video now. Okay, can you see my slide? Uh, we cannot see your slide yet. Uh, we can see yeah, your I think video. it's a security setting. I have to leave and then get in again. Sorry, I have to quit the app and then come back. All right, Sorry. definitely we can wait.
so we are waiting for uh, Dr. Tiparat oh, and to join us again. Oh, he's joining now. All right, we can hear you now. Okay, great. And we can also see your slides. Awesome. Perfect. Sorry, I just reinstalled my Zoom and I need to change my security setting. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> So we are, right. yo, please welcome uh, Tipara Chotibut uh, and then go ahead with your slide. Thank you. Okay. So good evening, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are. Um, Tipara Chotibut, you can call me Tip. I'm from the Department of Physics, Faculty of Science, Yula Longkorn University, and also from the research group called July Intelligent and Complex Systems, where we try to investigate the problem at the intersection of complexity science as well as intelligent, whether it be artificial or biological. So this talk is entitled is Demystifying Machine Learning Algorithms with Methods of Theoretical Physics. And I hope to convince you that some methods from physics that you might have forgotten long ago can become useful again in this age of machine learning. And I want to convince you also that the research in this particular direction can be truly interdisciplinary in a sense that the collaboration can be across many disciplines. And for example, my collaborators here are mostly physicists and some of them are mathematicians, neuroscientists, as well as economists. Um, I probably don't have I'm to sorry. introduce much. Sorry? Uh, so sorry for interrupting. Uh, can you uh, magnify the, the slide? I think you can click play. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. All right. That's better. Thank you. you can also see my cursor, right? Yeah. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, so probably don't need to introduce much how important AI is and towards the end of my PhD in 2015, I heard Andrew Ung uh, kind of proposes that AI is a new electricity and, and got interested in the field, even though my training is in theoretical physics. And then towards the end of 2017, uh, Ali Rahimi, who was a machine learning a scientist at Google uh, announced in a test of time talk at New Rips conference that machine learning practice back then, which is based mainly on deep learning has become almost like alchemy in which you try experimentally fiddling with around the neural network architectures and tuning parameters until you get what it, what, what it wants to do. But uh, in, in principle, it's really hard to understand why certain architecture of neural networks work. And if you look at neural networks as a collection of systems, uh, tools from physics, where you study uh, collective behaviors of macroscopic phenomena, such as the interaction between gas, how does it lead to collective behavior of phase transitions, tools from statistical physics in particular uh, becomes uh, plausible to be applied to study the understanding of neural networks uh, and machine learning in general. So that talk sort of inspired me to do a postdoc in machine learning. And as physicists, our hope, if you look back in time, what the alchemist does is that even though they can mix new elements that prove to be useful, that over time you need experimental validation and theory together, uh, with enough theory, you start to understand that alchemy is nothing but quantum physics of many body particles. And along similar reason, uh, we hope that neural networks or even complex machine learning algorithm with experimental control as well as theory together 
we might have uh, robots such as Sophia that has a backup theory in which when you ask Sophia why she thinks the way she thinks, you might have the reason to explain why. So that's, that's the overall goal that why I want to study machine learning from the perspective of physics because I want to understand how things work, how complex systems work. And because of the limited times, I probably can only give you a flavor of what methods from theoretical physics uh, can help answering or even inventing new algorithms for machine learning. Um, in particular, I'll be mentioning briefly and you're welcome to talk to me after the talks because this is supposed to give only a flavor of, of these methods. Uh, you can apply techniques from statistical physics to solve open problems such as what is the best or the least biased way to model activation function in deep learning. Uh, as on the left column, uh, you probably have heard that there are many variants of activation function. And in year 2017 and 18, the Google team used uh, extremely expensive reinforcement learning uh, search for the best activation function and they arrived at this form of activation function which they call switch basically if you have an input edge what it does is that it multiplies by some hyperparameter beta and apply the sigmoid activation and then multiply the input signal again so this simple form they call switch they found that it can be trained for a better generalization and better optimization for the deep learning. So in practice, people now start to use this switch activation function, but at the same time, that open question was still remained. Why does such an activation function is a good activation function at all? But it turns out there's a simple uh, statistical physics answer. If you want to look at a single neuron as a two-state probabilistic model, the least biased or the most uncommittal uh, prior distribution that you can model these two states that preserve the input mean is uh, the switch activation function. So we proposed this and submit to ICML in 2019 for theoretical physics of deep learning workshop. So this provides a justification that not only it proves to be useful practically, but there's a principle, which is the principle of maximum entropy or the least bias where to, mo to model binary neurons. Uh, so that's the first step and now I'll try to move away from deep learning. Uh, you probably have heard of restricted Boltzmann machine which a very good generative model can be trained but these days it's really hard to do any generative model compared to deep learning architecture so people stop looking at restricted Boltzmann machine even though it's the, one of the first model that's inspired by statistical physics uh, to learn some complex distribution of data. But the cons of the restricted Boltzmann machine, even though it has a Hebbian learning, it has a strong condition in which it can only learn a static distribution of data. For example, you can learn distribution of MNIST data set and generate sort of similar MNIST data set, but those are the static pattern that you want to learn and store. Um, the question remains, what happens if you break the symmetry in the weights in the restricted Boltzmann machine? You know that the restricted Boltzmann machine converge as an energy model because the weight is symmetric. As a result, you have the energy function. As a result, you have the local energy minima. As a result, you have the pattern that you can store. But if you break that symmetry, it turns out the dynamics become truly non-equilibrium. You no longer converge to the local energy minima in the landscape, and you cannot converge to a static patterns. But what you gain is the time series. Rather than converging to static patterns, you can build a model that converges around in the dynamical system language a limit cycle, which is a stable attractors that changes over time and it repeats itself. For example, in the paper in Triple AI, uh, we try to answer this question is there a way to incorporate? biological possibility in collaboration with neuroscientists. We know this process of spike timing dependence plasticity in which the timing between the pre-activation and post-activation neurons turns out to uh, becomes important towards adjusting the synaptic plasticity. And this is a typical curve of STDP curve in which if the pre-synaptic neurons happens before the postsynaptic neurons spike, uh, the synaptic waves become important and the way that it adjusted to be increased. On the other hand, if the postsynaptic neurons fire before the presynaptic neuron, that, that 
signal is unimportant and that weight is decreased. So this is a well-known mechanism of STDP and we try to incorporate this rule to the collection of neurons and try to incorporate that and to include heavy and learning and generalize the standard Boltzmann machine to now be able to learn not just a static data set, but this is time series that is a limit cycle. So these are one bit flip for every time step and at the last time step it will come back to itself. So I can show you the picture after training um, this, uh, sorry. Uh, sorry, Tiparat. So I think we are running out of time. So okay. probably like uh, 30 minutes, uh, 30 I, seconds and then we, we wrap. All uh, right, I will just show you the hallucinated uh, ICML training. We try the network to learn the sequence and it are able to generate the memory that is a cycle, a spatial temporal patterns. Uh, in the bottom bar, we show that it fit well with also the cat train spike data. And lastly, there are some methods from theoretical physics that allow you to ask uh, how does reinforcement learning agents when it interact in game theory, just that routing games, one of the most well-known algorithmic game theory games, behave as a function of time. And because of interest of time, I have to skip to the end, but uh, I just want to convince you that there are a lot of cool things that can be done from the tools of dynamical system, uh, theoretical physics. And last but not least, we are working on quantum machine learning in which we try to use uh, quantum entanglement uh, to try to understand the linearity in neural networks and we have some preliminary results that a number of hidden units in the recurrent neural network sometimes when you increase this it doesn't increase your training accuracy in this case for amdb data set but we show that there's a reason behind that if you look at the quantum version a quantum equivalent of recurrent neural networks, you can calculate the so-called entanglement entropy and increasing the number of hidden units beyond that doesn't increase the entanglement. And as a result, you don't need that many parameters. So we are working on explainability of NLP models. And because we don't have time, if you want to talk more, we have this research group with a lot of people that work at in this intersection and more questions uh, can be asked now and you can send me emails, we are recruiting. PhD students and postdoc as well. Awesome, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tiparat. Uh, so we uh, sadly don't have time for questions, but this is an amazing talk. And um, if you guys have any more questions, please follow him on uh, email or Twitter, or go to Chulalongkorn University to ask more about the research that he's doing. These are like such a great research. So uh, uh, this mark our end, uh, the end of our first session, uh, and we're going to have 10 minutes break, and then we will resume again at 8:10 uh, p.m. Uh, Bangkok time zone. And thank you everyone for tuning in, uh, and see you in 10 minutes. Thank you so much, also Dr. Tiparat. Thank you.
ลโทสเทสฮัลโหลครับฮัลโหลฮัลโหลเจสไม่เห็นเย็บอัมสต็อปปิ้งแชร์ริ้งไมค์สกรีนและคุณสามารถเทคโอเวอร์คุณลองทำนะอ่าเวลมีพิษคุณคุณคุณคุณได้ยินไหมไวท์เฟิร์สใช่ใช่ฉันได้ยินคุณครับคุณได้ยินไหมใช่ใช่ฉันได้ยินครับผมอืมชัดชัดชัดเวลมีพิษ So there's a but button. Yeah. Okay. I'm s h a r e screen now. Can you see my slide? Uh, not yet. No, it just back. When are you see? The, uh, do you see? No, I don't see anything. Oh. I already see a back screen. Oh, uh, this one. Uh, what about this one? Oh, uh, do you see my slide now? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, wait, baby, this way is better. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can you see my face? And uh, okay, we start at uh, 2010, in, right? Yeah, in one minute. One minute. Okay. Up. So around uh, six minutes after your talk, I will remind you that you will have one minute left, and then we will start uh, the Q and A session for your talk. Yes. So I think if you are ready, so you can start now. And oh yes, okay. Uh, good so, afternoon. Uh, oh, okay, sorry. So the next speaker is uh, Kun uh, Son Suksathar. He is going to talk about his uh, works on redesigning skip network for crowd counting with dilated conversion and backwards connections. So if you if you're ready, please uh, start. Hi. Okay. Thank you for your introduction. So my name is Son Suksathar. I'm the currently a postdoctoral researcher at Netech. So this topic is about uh, my PhD research, and when I study that PhD study, and first of all, I write to a uh, uh, brief introduction, introduction for the crowd accounting. So the crowd accounting is, is some kind of the object counting method for the for the uh, the, the crowd image that is have so many objects and have already overlapping. Uh, region so that it cannot uh, where the decision based method cannot handle it. So uh, with the deep learning technique, so uh, the crowd accounting trend to use about the uh, aggregation based method to forward the density to forward the density that's showing current density map that's showing the characteristics of crowd density in each regions. So so in this way, they, they use the scene and as the estimation network and then PD density map here. Let's show the high, high row is mean the high density in this, in this case. And they have the unit functions to predict the number of objects. So about our research is focused on the scaling problem that to decide estimation network that to use for predict and improve the density map in, in this way. Uh -huh. That as you see in that they have so many. This is assemble of the crowd uh, image, crowd image that they have so many style of ob object or people. And here this is for the people counting. And for my work is to to uh to reduce this, uh, the scaling problem. So we use try to use skip conditions that is in to increase the density field size. 
to handle the object side, right? And so <clears throat> in this, uh, we use right the uh, backward conditions that is the uh, opposite to the uh, normal steep conditions. For the normal no steep condition or forward condition, it is to try to use the lower lower level features map and and uh, emphasize the higher level feature map, right? You can say that is about well unit. This is five frameworks and rest it. And for this one, it's opposite. Let's use the uh, higher level features to the lower features. Okay. So why do you just use that? So uh, as a characteristic, characteristic of the uh, feature map that uh, the crowd the usually have a small object in the frame, small object in the frame. So they have small details. So it means that they handle the lower features. So that's why we, we try to emphasize this uh this uh, this low level features. Uh -huh. So by by emphasizing the uh, shallow layers or low, low low level features, so they have some advantage that is hand at the niche. Uh, incoming information from the deeper layers, so they can, uh, <coughs> sorry, they can improve the uh, uh, the counting performance in the in the higher level feature as well. <coughs> so we, before we uh, we talk about the skip condition, then we talk about uh, my backbone network in this experiment. So in my backbone network, it can is modified from a unit as it's a framework famous network for the semantic dimensions. So it's a, uh, I see that they have the, you can see that this is about the uh, uh, unit network, like this the U shape, but we have six function of course. So we try to use a pure network like this. And you can see that they have the points and upstream pin layers for this case to, to <coughs> sorry. <coughs> so since the, uh, the pool up in, and so up is just is is uh, used for the uh, recite and up recite a uh, resolution of feature map to increase the recessive fields for the uh, feature map. Mm -hmm. However, they have some recessivity that is can uh, have the might have lost some uh, uh, semantic information or special information right Mr. Pompas said before. So that's why we try to repair this one to use the right uh, conver conversion layers. But this one is held is held to uh it had a state function as pooling layers, but it had keep the restoration image of feature map. So that's why that is uh estimated information from the density map. The final saw is can be deduced. I mean the the loss from the density map can be deduced. First, uh backward conditions. So as you see that this is about as simple for the forward condition and backward condition here. So for my, for my <coughs> for my idea that it cannot uh for sorry <coughs> as I mentioned before that uh, they use try to use the higher level features for emphasize the low, lower level features for this case. However, we cannot know features. So we see that they cannot use the uh, as only unit network for for uh estimation network with level conditions. So that's why we, we I try to use a uh, uh, another identical network. With this case, we call a name network here. So name network has only one function that to uh, formulate the high level features and then emphasize the master network here. And master network sorry. generate final result. Sorry, sorry. sorry okay, for I will finish that. You have one minute. Yep. How come? Yeah, just sorry. So the counting performance is you can say that uh, it is about the uh, the conditions you can see that it have the better performance here. However, that is have the if they have some more layers, so it have worse performance. So they have some limitation here, and this is a simple for the uh, radiation convolutions between the uh, without that is condition use the pool layer. You can see that in some case, especially for the high crowd density, we have the information loss from the about the intensity map. So it means they have error for under counting errors. I think this is a uh, already seven seventy now. So let me conclude. This is about my conclusions. Uh, sorry, this is come up now. So it is that the end of my presentation here. Sorry. Okay. Any so, questions? So thank sorry. you very much for for your talk. Is there any question from the audience? Please, uh, you can type it or I can.
So perhaps I can ask a question. So do you plan to yeah. like uh, release your uh, software as a, an open source project that people can use and test? Uh, actually, I have a public in the GitHub. I, I, I will provide you in the after meeting. So what is this? in that case, it's just for the weaker counting, not the people counting now. So they have this, another project. Is uh, I, I already uh, I have it already, but this one I haven't published yet. But I, I plan the future. Okay. Sorry. Thank okay. you. Okay. So there is one question from which from uh, Zoom. So can this be applied or transferred to any interest objects such as cars or trucks? A uh, person? Sorry. So the, the question is like, is it possible that we can use your uh, framework to something else like a uh, uh, counting cars or trucks? Oh yeah, yeah, it can be. Crowd, so. It can be anything object, but uh, I'm not sure for the for the animal. I haven't tested it, but it's, it's possible. But we must to modify a network for for optimize the the specific performance for each species. And I'm sure I heard that his class. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's another quick yes. question. So how does the backwards connection work? How does the machine work? Mm, so this this work is about the is a some kind of the uh to how to say that. So it's about to try to uh predict the the directions of the external layers. So in which directions is this correct way? So if you keep the um a future or incoming information, so the the future in the lower lower variable can go to the direct, to the correct directions. So, so this is about the main main uh, direction for the Bible conditions. All right, I think I hope you address all the questions and thank again. Oh. Un, uh, Hi, thank you very much. For, it's okay. for, <laughs> for for the talk. And so the next Hi. speaker is uh, Kun uh, Kanchi. Uh, so I wish Shai. Rong Shai. And he's going to talk about his work on rapid prototyping of an inexpensive camera with low code machine learning, wide recognition for pangolin conservation research in Thailand. So if you're ready, please share your screen and you can start. Okay, just want to check if can uh, you can see my uh, screen? Yes. And if you can, can you try to okay? move your pointer? So just to make okay, sure that okay, good. yep, yep, okay. that's good. You can start now. Okay. Good evening. Uh, my name is Kanchit Rongchai. So I'm uh, uh, at uh, Ratamukon Konkan at the moment, and I am going to present uh, our work, uh, which is rapid prototyping of uh, a cheap camera with low cost deep learning wildlife recognition for pangolin. Uh, conservation. So this work is in collaboration with the Zoological uh, Society uh, of London, um, Thailand, which is in Kantanaburi. Uh, so this is more of a, a practitioner side of machine learning. So we are trying to showcase uh, our collaboration with between engineers and uh, conservation uh, researchers. Uh, so uh, I hope you enjoy our work. So the contents of we are going to talk about uh, the pangolin conservation situation in Thailand and then what challenges we are facing and then the machine learning pipeline that we uh, developed and then uh, we move on to the system design and rapid pro uh, prototyping results and then uh, a bit of conclusions. Uh, so here is a little story of uh, Hope, which is the name of this little uh, pangolin uh, who has been uh, rescued by uh, uh, the uh, conservation worker in Kantanaburi. So whether or not um, uh, we can uh, make this little creature survive uh, depends on the knowledge of the, uh, the creatures 
of the species. But um, the knowledge of uh, local pangolin in Thailand is not uh, well known, despite the fact that it's been researched all over the world. So uh, locally in Thailand, we need a research to uh, stop this uh, a heavily trafficked endangered species from uh, extinction. So that's uh, really uh, uh, lies, uh, uh, which is the uh, sorry, the, which is the importance of our work. And um, what uh, the uh, Zoological Society of London is doing at the moment is to collaborate with the uh, the organisation that um, look after. Um, a national park to install uh, hunting trap cameras, which you can see on the screen, uh, in national parks and record images and videos of the uh, pangolins uh, in Thailand. And from the images and video, uh, researchers can understand um, uh, the habitat and behaviors of Thai pangolins and try to pinpoint where exactly uh, their habitat uh, is in Thailand. But uh, the challenges that uh, we are facing is that uh, trap cameras are currently imported and quite expensive. So that means that limited numbers are deployed. So it means limited geographical data uh, has been collected. So uh, the more cameras, the better. Uh, and then um, uh, conservationists are faced with a vast number of images to process uh, manually. So that means it's really tiring and time consuming to uh, identify which images are of pangolins and which images are of other species or even false triggers. Sometimes you get lights coming or, or falling leaves and then you get uh, useless uh, uh, pictures. So I, our idea uh, is that we want to develop a machine learning uh, binary image classifier to uh, automatically uh, classify pangolins from other species and false triggers so we can save time automate the system and also increase efficiency because we can reduce human error due, uh, due to tiredness and uh, tedious work. So that's uh, 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 the, the main kind of objective of our work. And uh, um, so we kind of got together uh, engineers, um, uh, mechanical engineers, machine learning engineers and, and zoologists are working across disciplinary. And also we, we want to uh, you know, we, we, we came up uh, with this idea um, uh, a couple of months ago, and, and we want to make it, you know, a, a prototype that is fast and, and rapid. So we, uh, we want a, a platform that is easy and fast to develop. And uh, uh, working with engineers, we can uh, design uh, the, uh, the prototype and, and, and make it, you know, a, as a case example. Uh, so the system design consists of a, a microcontrol, a, a micro microcomputer, which is uh, affordable, uh, powered by a five volt battery, um, and we have camera module, GPS module, and also motion detector, so that we can detect uh, any motions and uh, uh, also lock a GPS location, so we know exactly where uh, the animals uh, are found, and also the, the images are installed uh, to SD card. Uh, so that's uh, our kind of system. And then we move on to the rapid prototyping. So um, uh, the mechanical sides uh, designed um, the, the 3D model of what the camera would look like. And, and we, were, we work in collaboration with the conservation uh, researchers to, to kind of develop a bespoke design uh, to kind of um, uh, uh, to make uh, the, the, the prototype suitable for practice. And then we pre uh, and the model can be 3D printed within two days. So that means that we can put everything together uh, uh, fast and quick. Uh, and here is our ma machine learning pipeline. Um, so we have a training data set that we collected from field work. So, so we obtain images from, uh, the, uh, uh, from, from the, the zoologist workers, um, but also we also got some images from the internet because uh, we, we, we have limited numbers of um, uh, images. And then we augmented the data, uh, the images by cropping, rescaling, and also we, we create five variations of the images uh, with um, a randomly, um, a random brightness, contrast, uh, saturation, et cetera, with noise to kind of reflect the, the real situation of the, the field work. And then here we comes with a pre-trained machine learning model 
uh, because we want fast developing, you know, we, we, we want uh, the training time to be as quick as possible. So we use transfer learning model, uh, which has been uh, uh, trained using uh, image uh, net data set. And then we input our uh, own uh, tra uh, training data sets, and then we, we can develop the training uh, of the machine learning, and then we, we create the, the model. So now, because we want the, the model to be used by um, conversation researchers, we want uh, as low uh, code as possible. So we, we lump everything together into a no code, easy to use machine learning development platform, uh, which is uh, already open source so that um, it is free to use and, and anyone can use and develop their own uh, machine learning model. Uh, so that's the, really the idea is to, to get a quick machine learning done. And here are the, the, um, the training images. And I'm sorry for interrupting. You have around uh, one minute to okay, that's fine. So, yeah. so, so we classify into pangolin images, non pangolin images. So the images are obtained from real uh, a field work. And uh, here comes the model. We used uh, the ResNet 50 version 2. Um, um, so I don't have time to go into detail, but you can refer to my references here to look into why uh, we use this one because it's one of the most popular models for image classif uh, classification and it's uh, really powerful and uh, 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 good. And here are the, uh, the machine learning implementation stage. We use Lob, which is Microsoft, uh, it has been made um, open source last month actually, so we use it. And then we use uh, uh, TensorFlow, uh, we import, export it as a TensorFlow Lite model, and we implement it, uh, embedding it into a, a microcontroller to make it. And then we test it with uh, 65 randomly selected images, and we, have, we found that night, uh, the accuracy was 99%. So this is pretty good. Uh, despite that, we would have to get more images from field work. So here is our workflow. So we, we developed a prototype and then uh, we hope that we can de uh, deploy the, the prototype and collect more data and make the, the, the model more accurate. So what we can learn is that we can, you know, uh, uh, make use of, of machine learning uh, easily and rapidly and uh, uh, by making it accessible to other uh, a field, you know, it, it, it can uh, uh, do good things like save nature, save wildlife, and uh, yeah, so, so this is the, an example. So I just want to finish with uh, Sir David Attenborough's quote, we must rediscover how to we live in balance with nature and help to create a better world for ourselves and generations to come. What happens next is up to us. So I just uh, uh, finished with the invitation for you guys, you know, AI community in Thailand to work in environment and, and wildlife. So it is a fun field to work on and it's uh, really good. So thank you very much. So thank you very much, uh, Kun Kanji, for this uh, talk and it seemed to be very interesting and important projects. So uh, there's a couple of questions from the audience and one question is mine. So it's like, do you plan to publish your training set uh, to the community. Perhaps I think ML machine learning practitioners can play with these data sets and maybe learn about uh, these uh, wildlife conservation issue. Yes, absolutely. Because um, the, the idea is we want to uh, promote the work on wildlife and environments anyway. So uh, it would be good. So we hope that we can uh, maybe publish a paper or or something like that in the future. So indeed, yes. And there's a, a person that would like to ask uh, your, I mean, ask the questions mm -hmm. on stage. So Kwai Kambun, could you please uh, ask your question now? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. 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 yes, thank you. Thank you very much for the wonderful talk. Um, so I think my question is um, from your from your um, perspective, um, what would be the sort of the missing piece of the puzzle that you would need from the community to help you develop a more successful system? Um, uh, that's a really good question uh, uh, because the thing is AI is is more uh, a, a very new thing for for us too. I mean, um, uh, we probably even 
uh, don't know what, what we really need. So we, we need more examples of, of, uh, of the AI being used to, to solve problems. So in terms of engineers, uh, uh, me, myself, uh, being an engineer, we, 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 we try to use AI to solve engineering problems. So I think what we need is, is more examples of what uh, AI can be used. And, uh, and by trial and error, I think um, uh, we, we help each other grow as a community in Thailand. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think but, the lack of knowledge. But, but do you have like, so do you have mm -hmm. the problem in terms of the data as well or, or just yeah, the I, expertise I the more, in like yes. how? The, the, the more data will be better and probably the, the better computational uh, power will right. be better for, for us. Right. But um, as as recently, uh, uh, Microsoft released the, the open source uh, machine learning development platform, as I said, uh, it has helped a lot with the development of prototype. Um, uh, so yes, so in, in the past, we would have to dig down to the, the, the coding of everything. And, and that's kind of slows down the process by making the open source and making it easy to use, I think it's, 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 the, it's the key. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. So always uh, due to the interest of time, I think we have to end it here. So please, uh, if you are interested in this kind of work, please follow up uh, uh, with Kun Kanchis at this uh, email that he chose. So the next speaker is uh, Kun uh, Chompakon. So if you are ready, please uh, share your screen. So Kun Kanchis, could you please uh, stop sharing? Yes, thank you. Uh, Kun Pakon, can you please start sharing your screen now? Okay. Oh, so thanks. the next speaker is uh, Kun uh, Chompakons, he's going to talk about uh, his project on a large uh, scale data collection from the internet for Thai language and speech processing. So uh, uh, I need to leave the meeting because I just adjust the configuration for allowing the camera. Okay. Uh, like for a sec. Okay, now can you see my screen? Yes, I can see your screen. So you can start now. Okay. Uh, so hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Chumbakon Jack Sanche uh, I'm a research assistant at uh, Vistech Depa, uh, the same with Pipong. So today, me and Pip, uh, today I'm going to present about my work together with my co authors, Pipong, or like uh, you all know, Mr. Korakot Chawawanish. Uh, about the large scale data collection from the internet for language, for Thai language and speech processing. Uh, so our work divided into two main parts uh, for the G2P Grapheme 2 phoneme datasets that was used to produce the Rexicon model, as well as the uh, speech processing mod, uh, datasets, which are called automatic speech recognition or ASR in short. Okay, so Let's first start with the G2P section. Okay. Uh, currently, there are like a lot of G2P datasets that are available, like Lotus and Tsings from Nectech and Tainos, Wanapong, and so on and so forth. But unluckily, we cannot combine all these datasets together and train one strong models because of the different annotation guidelines. Uh, I will give an example later in the next slides. Uh, but what I want to point out is that uh, different datasets comes with different amount of data and different problems. 
for example, like the Lotus and T-Sync has their own annotation guidelines, like they're separate the uh, labeling between the onsets and codas, while some uh, one upon which contain a lot of resources uh, use that tag the phoneme as a TypeScript, not in the traditional phoneme words and so on. So our work aims to combine all these data set into one. And here are some, some examples from the data sets. You can see here that uh, the, sorry, the onset and the codas of Lotus and T-Sync are distinguished by these uh, small symbol. So this is different from TNC and TLTK data sets where you cannot see the, the difference between the onsets and the codas. While these three other data sets here, these two, I mean, uh, the Wanapong and Thai nodes, they contain no tonal marks like Lotus and TLTK here. You can see that they both mark at tones while these two aren't. And Thai nodes also have their own uh, annotation standards, which are all different. So this problem makes it hard to train one powerful G2P model because of you can combine all these data sets together. And the another point is that uh, there are also many available G2P tools, ex actually not many, but we, we've so far found four, uh, the TH pronoun, TLTK, MFA generate dictionary, and EPTran. These four also comes up with their own unique net, of, uh, their own problems, like TH pronoun, they return the phoneme, but they, they return multiple phonemes, but they didn't rank any, so it's hard for us to, to use the results of this model. And yeah, as, so, as I said, so our works aim to create two things for G2P, uh, the data sets, and if possible, we might create the G2P models that are uh, standardized, the annot annotation too. Uh, uh, and here's our planet approach. Uh, so first, uh, we're gonna convert the phone set from different data set using a simple mapping rules, but this might take a while. But th these are all in the work in progress section. And, but there's a problem here. If you remember, we call here from Wanapong, uh, that Wanapong data set uh, labels the phonemes as raw type words. So we might tweak this a little bit by using these tools to convert those Thai words into phonemes and then further do the mapping rules. And then we are gonna do some confidence score to filter out some different sources and also do some manual checking on some popular ambiguous words. And finally, we might use some syllable segmentation like to help with the word pronunciation for the tools that we might plan to build in the future. And here's for the G2P section. And next is about uh, the speech corpus. Uh, so I want to start with the <laughs> motivation for me to working on this project because that from what I know here, uh, there are like 12 hours of open source data for Thai ASR, like Lotus contain around roughly six hours, while uh, Gowaji dataset contains uh, for around six hours also with a total of 12. This is like very hard and it's like very scarce compared to another country's data sets. Like you can see Singapore is building a 3000 hours data set. Vietnam already contain like at least 400 hours of data sets. So me and Pipong are like planning to build uh, an open source ASR data set that are publicly available on the internet. And luckily we have found this website called TaiMook. Uh, this is like a website that contains a lot of online classes in Thai with the subtitles. And you can see here that uh, the license is Creative Commons. So it's quite safe to use and prepose it and uh, release as a public data set. And the most interesting part is that you can download the subtitle in the SRT format, which is perfect to collect the transcription of the videos. And Excuse me, sorry for interrupting, but you have like uh, one minute to conclude the presentation. Oh, okay. Sure. Uh, and here's we just in the progress of just scraping the data. Uh, we've got around like around thousand hours, which is a lot, but uh, we need to know that these thousand hours haven't been processed yet. 
and these are some statistics which is uh, which was calculated after I scraped. We scraped for like a total of 305 courses. But the road to the free data set isn't that easy. <laughs> we also like contains a lot of problem. Like sometimes the subtitle doesn't align with the video and sometimes they got some strange token, like and the utterances are not tokenized. The timestamp is sometimes like messed up. It's longer than the video duration and so on. We need to clean all the data and make sure that people can use it easily. Here's some like example. I take all the tokens available in the sub, uh, subtitles and you can see there's a, like a lot of Greeks and Korean tokens which are conform like linguistic and Korean courses and these Greek uh, characters are like from some physics and some phonetics courses. This needs all this to be clean too. And also this are some fun fun things like some file duration is like 320 seconds while the start timestamp of the subtitle is like 367 like this doesn't make any sense. So we need to further clean these uh, bad utterances out or maybe use acoustic model to realign the subtitles. So we plan to release these two data sets, but we want to make sure that our release is perfect enough to release so that uh, other people can use it and create a great model. Uh, and so uh, that's wrap up for all my presentation. Thank you everyone for your attention. So well, thank you very much, Kun uh, Shompakorn, for this talk. And there's uh, at one question from Zoom. Do you consider different actions? Uh, currently, uh, no. The for the accent factors, uh, I didn't calculate it exactly. I don't know how to benchmark it, but so far we know that there's like a lot of speaker on the three hundred and five courses because some courses contain different people and different background. So I, I, I will assume that these are quite robust enough. Mm -hmm. but, but this needs to be tested later. Yep. And do you know roughly male or female ratio of the speech data set? Uh, uh, I haven't count yet, but there's like no statistic to that say whether this video was spoken by male or female, but we also plan to count the number of speakers by using some uh, basic uh, gender classification to see the ratio between males and females, and we might try to adjust this ratio too. All right. So I think that is it, and thank you again, Queen Shumpakorn, for the for the talk. And so the next speaker is uh, Kun Charin. So if you're ready, please share your screen and we can start. All right. You guys can hear me? Yes. All right. OK, and let's, get, let's get started. Um, wait. So right now, your presentation is not full screen. Ah, it's OK. It, uh, it's Oh, okay. Um, it was intentional. Um, so you can see you can see me. Hello, uh, I can see my screen. All right. Um, let's get started. Um, today, I would like to introduce um, part of the work that I've done uh, for AI Research .in .th for the SCD uh, machine learning machine translation data set. Um, this is part of the data set curation. It's part of the one million sentences. Um, Basically, this is how we, we can create a tie to basically any language, parallel corpus from Wikipedia dump um, with the help of two main things, which is the CRF-based segment, uh, sentence segmentation, it's called CRF cut, um, and the multilingual sentence uh, encoder by Google, right? So basically, um, I'm lying a little bit here. It's not tied to any language. It's, it's more like tied to the 60 language in um, uh, sent, uh, universal sentence encoder, right? Um, anyways, uh, so we all know the story of Thai language overall, right? Um, especially in par in terms of parallel text, it's a very hard word to pronounce. Parallel. Um, if we exclude the the Opus data set, which is like mainly open subtitles, um, and sometimes when people like to use that, there are issues of copyrights and so on, right? Um, but 
let's say we disregard that that is about like three million sentence pairs. Um, if we exclude opus, Thai English sentence pair is about one million sentence pairs, right? Um, and this, as you can see, is nothing compared to like 75 million French English, 60 million German English, right? And even if even you compare with the things that are close to us, um, Vietnamese has 2 million. Um, and Thai English 1 million is it's actually just come out this year with uh, SCD uh, machine translation, right? So you can see it's, it's, it's quite small. We're, we're quite small compared to other language pairs, right? But but actually, when, when you think it, when you think of it in absolute terms, we're, we're quite small. But if you think of it as normalized by number of, of speakers of those language, maybe maybe we're not we're not that bad, right? Um, the ratio between number of sentence pairs, Thai English sentence pairs, and other language English sentence pairs, normalized by the population of of the speakers, um, were in the same level as as Japanese and well, not not Japanese, but like maybe around Chinese because there are so many Chinese people, right? Um, so, but still, still, right? It's we, we like to to have much more of these, and um, and especially we, we like to have much more of these in in open source domain like CC by SA or something like that, right? So, um, this is a story that I think every almost every single uh, person who works in Thai NLP, uh, be it research or 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 uh, industry like myself um, does every time, right? Um, uh, Facebook released this data set called Wikimetrics, which basically what it does is that it, it mines all the Wikipedia dumps of, they say, um, 1,000, well, it's, uh, it's actually uh, 95 languages. So it's, it comes down to uh, 1,620 language pairs and it's like, more than a hundred million parallel sentences. So every time, right, these kind of news come out, everyone who works in Thai NLP, what they do is that they press control F and type the word Thai. And then what they find is usually like, oh, um, sorry, we, we don't do Thai, right? And that's, that's, a, that's a quite a frustrating story of, 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 of my life, actually. Um, so, so yeah, so, but the idea is there, right? So the idea is, is it works pretty well. And the only reason actually that the author of Wikimetrics said that they don't do Thai is because um, they said we don't have a reliable um, sentence segmenter, right? So, um, but, but if you look, if, if you say like, okay, then um, we need to build our own sentence segmentation, right? Let's say we can do that, what, what will happen? Basically, you can see that, okay, we will have access to to a lot of Wikipedia resources. Our Wikipedia is about um, 0.29 um, gigabyte in, in compressed dump. So if you expand it, it's about 500 uh, megabytes. Um, still very small compared compared to other countries, right? English is like no comparison, but um, Turkey also larger than us, Indonesia uh, and Vietnam, right? VI is for Vietnam, it's not VN for some reason. Vietnam is like three times our, our Wikipedia, but, but still, right? Um, I think all these languages are, are in Google's um, universal sentence encoder, and we can actually do similar things that Wikimetrics has done and create these parallel corpus, right? Um, so here, here's, here's when, when I was trying to, to find a lot of parallel sentences for SCBMT, um, we, we really, had a lot of issues. We ran through a lot of issues. We, we weren't making it in time for the deadline. So we we actually, initially we weren't planning to use the Wikipedia, but then um, deadline is there, just need to get it done. So this is the idea. Okay, let's try to do something very similar to Wikimetrics, but in time, right? So what do we, we do actually? Um, all these codes you can run, uh, all these steps uh, you can run in the repository. I actually share in the chat of both the Facebook and the Zoom. Basically, you just go to this, right? Um, so what you do is that you have Wikipedia DOM, you download it, you, you have a bunch of XML files, convert it to CSVs, align them by the titles, right? Because usually, um, you know, uh, fun fact, right? Uh, I just know that Wikipedia um, of all countries are actually independent of each other. So they, 
maybe the, the even though they have the same titles, like they say like Wikipedia about Cristiano Ronaldo or something like that, in Thai and English could be a total different Wikipedia, right? So, but but I mean, we we can we we want to assume that usually they're gonna talk about the same things. So we're gonna align this and have parallel articles, and these are the two main things that that I think um, we do we do in in a more different way than than what we've done before, which is um, create the parallel sentences and then align those sentences, right? Um, so uh, the, the red part, the create sentence, is basically the sentence segmentation, and the, blue, uh, the, the green part is basically the sentence alignment. Right? Um, our sentence segmenter, we, we made it a very simple stuff uh, because, you know, um, has, has, wrote, has written in uh, 2007 about word tokenization and sentence tokenization, sentence segmentation, right? that Thai language doesn't really have, like it's, it's kind of dubious we even have sentences at all, right? So, so what, what we actually think is the next best thing and also some things that suggested in the paper is just use English word boundaries, to use full stops and all the punctuations, right? So we, we, were, we were able to do this because we have a bunch of translated text. So what we did is that uh, we generate some reviews using um, CTRL models. So it's a fake Amazon reviews we have our translator translate that into Thai and then ask them to mark the, the sentence boundary at the full stop, right? And then we use that um, boundary to train our CRF model, which is, um, I think basically the features are created like this. So let's say you at the position of the word ku, right? Um, we'll create unigram, bigram, tigram of a sliding window of two, right? So we, we'll add pad until you have a window of two before and two after, and we create a uh, unigram, bigram, trigram after that, right? And that's basically it. Um, we also add some sentence starters and sentence enders. Sentence enders like krap, ka, the honorifics. Uh, sentence starters like all the, all the, the, the connection words, right? Um, the details can, you can read in the SEBMT paper, which I already posted in the link. So you can see that, um, well, it, it kind of works actually. Uh, this is uh, from our um, beloved PM. He said on on this date, so you can see that okay, it it, it kind of can can segment sentences and it can understand that okay, not all space are separators. If you have some connectives like this, they are the same sentence, like a compound sentence. So I mean, it is not that bad as you can see um, the the accuracy and the F one score. Um, of predicting if a space is is the sentence and the, it's pretty good, right? Um, you can see if you, on especially on the the product reviews, which is the the main the main data set that it was trained on. Orchid is a little bit tricky because if you look if you actually look at Orchid, the sentence boundary in Orchid is kind of loopy, right? And TED also uh, these are TED transcripts. They are they are not actually segmented at the sentence level. They're actually segmented at like the speaker stops speaking level, right? So it does, these two won't, we're not, we don't expect them to perform good, but in, in things that we especially train for, like full stops, uh, punctuations, um, it performs pretty good in terms of accuracy and F1. Yeah. We, we have a good, I think- I'm Sorry for interrupting, but you have like one minute to wow. bring cool okay. and then- so we have a good enough, but it's not super good. So when we do um, like some, some random sentence like this, we can't really segment it well. Um, but then, um, so when, when we, we want to align, we need to do some, we need to stitch some sentence together and make some like uni sentences, by sentences, try sentences, and then use the, the vectors created by universal sentence encoder just to align the stuff like this. And uh, sure enough, things that are like uh, segmented with with same amount of, of sentences uh, have the highest cosine similarity score. And then we generate it. Uh, after we generate it, we do some quality control by filtering out the one with the low um, cosine similarity scores, right? And we have some some nice sentences like this uh, with high cosine similarity scores, and some not so nice like this, right? So basically, this is how. Uh, we created about, um, I think, 30,000 sentence pairs from uh, about um, 500 megabyte of Thai wiki. Right? And, and, and in, in theory, you can do it with any of the 16 languages or any language if you have the universal sentence encoder that can do uh, Thai to something language. Right? Okay. 
um, is that uh, you guys still have some time or? So I, th I think we have time off now. So yeah. do you have any last sentence to speak or should we go ahead to the question? Yeah, I think, I think you can go ahead for, for the question. Yeah, okay. So there's a couple of questions, but I think we have to choose and ask only one. So there's, there's one question asked, how do you know when some sentences do not have their pairs? Some sentences do not have their pairs. Uh, actually, that that's a good question. Is because um, so we we basically just rely on the cosine similarity score, right? Because if you can look at at these, these are a quite good example. Oh, I have this slide also. Um, so things that are not pair of each other actually have have quite low, like uh, usually uh, below zero point five cosine similarity, right? Things like he was a professor and then in the year 1927. So these actually are from the same uh, Napoleon articles of Thai and English. But as, as you can see, like they, the only thing they have in common is Napoleon. So the, the score is, is, is quite pretty, quite low, right? So of course this, this is not foolproof and uh, the data set is gonna be, is bound to be a little bit noisy, but we, we try to rely on like high cosine similarity score to help us filter out uh, these uh, non-pair sentences. All right. So thank you very much, Kun Sharing, for the talks. And please uh, stop sharing. And Kun uh, Vishafong, would you please share your screen? All right. So the next speaker is uh, Kun Vichapong, and he's going to talk about uh, his projects on end-to-end -end machine learning pipelines in big retail, showcases of recommendations and search system at tops online. All right, okay. So, uh, hi everyone. My name is uh, Vichapong Jeruntam. I'm a data scientist at Central Technology Organization. Today, on behalf of our data team, I will be presenting about uh, our end-to-end -end, uh, machine learning pipeline on the application of a recommendation and search system at our Tops Online. So today I will be covering about our, our recommendation system and search model. And then I will talk about our ML pipeline implementation. And finally, I will talk about our future implementation plan, uh, improvement plan. So, for our uh, recommendation system and search model, our recommendation system consists of our uh, two recommendation models. Uh, the first one is their personalized uh, recommendation mo model. We use their BPR model to rank a recommended uh, product for each user based on their past uh, purchase transaction. So this BPR model is just uh, a variant, another variant of a pairwise machine learning model. The model uh, architecture is pretty simple. Uh, the only learnable parameter for the model are just their user embeddings and item embeddings as shown on their diagram. Um, we use the add K uh, accuracy for measuring our model performance and we use uh, the recommendation of most frequently purchased items of each user as our baseline for the model. We found that um, this baseline is, yeah. This baseline is uh, pretty hard to break as our customers uh, tends to buy the same grocery over and over. However, uh, we outperform their baseline on the aspect of our recommendation, uh, recommending a new products to customer. Here is the overview of how we put our recommendation models together and alongside with the search ranking model. So the BPR model that I just explained, uh, it uh, outputs the users and item embeddings. These embeddings are used for generating um, personalized uh, recommendation 
and uh, cross categories product recommendation. The item, uh, we have another separate model for generate our uh, same category product recommendation or similar product recommendation. Uh, the item embeddings from their two recommendation model are used as input uh, feature for our search ranking model to help uh, boosting their performance of their search ranking model. And here's an example of uh, our different uh, recommendations on tops online. Okay. All right. Um, so we've been utilizing our embedding quite a lot in uh, CTO. Uh, here is a demo of how we could use um, item embeddings for recommending product based on uh, several item in a customer basket. So let me uh, hop to the demo. So um, imagine that you are shopping for your dinner cooking. You might like to um, cook a spaghetti for your dinner tonight. So um, you search for uh, spaghetti and you pick it to your basket. Okay. Um, the recommended product are then like uh, generated based on their similarity of their uh, embeddings of their spaghetti and all other products on the web. Then you might would like to add like a spaghetti sauce to your basket. Then the embeddings of several items in your basket could be uh, arithmetically combined to generate a new recommended product list and so on and so on. For instance, um, you might want to add like cheese to your basket based on their combined embedding of product in your basket. You might further want to add like a pork sausage to your basket, something like this. All right. So next, um, I will be talk. I will be talking about our machine learning pipeline implementation. So um, it's a pretty lengthy uh, diagram here. So here is the our ML pipeline implementation for the use case of uh, compute and store machine, uh, the prediction output from machine learning model and serving on their database. Okay. Um, so we starting from defining a problem with clients or internally with our data team. Then we develop a model on our interactive our IDE like a Jupyter notebook. Then we test our model against uh, validation data. We confirm if a uh, certain performance is met. We also confirm if a model outperforms a predefined baseline with a reasonable margin. So if our model makes sense, we then um, develop our, our code for production by packetizing our code in libraries for reusability and building apps or script of their uh, developed uh, libraries. We do some unit testing and quality assurance of their prediction output to really make sure that um, their prediction uh, output from machine learning model really makes sense to our eyes. Then we hand, hand over their, our task further to their uh, data engineer for productionizing our machine learning model. So um, starting from um, the first task of their um, data engineer, they would like take our code repository and containerize our ML project, register their uh, Docker image on their um, Docker repository. Then we use um, Airflow for scheduling and Control, controlling our workflow, which we have a separate work, workflow for training our model and predicting uh, and generating a prediction output. So for the, for the training workflow, 
we starting from query a label data from the data lake. Then we spawn a large uh, VM instance to the register Docker image, executes our scripts or application fit uh, our data pre-processing pipeline and model and dump it on their uh, S3 for later use in their prediction workflow. Then uh, for their prediction workflow, it starts by a uh, query, uh, the non-label data from data lake Again, we spawn a smaller size of our VM instance to the Docker image, execute uh, our uh, prediction application and pre uh, load the data pipeline and model from our S3 and transform the data and predict um, and generate their prediction output. Their prediction output is then stored uh, on S3 and it got our uh, ingest to the output database. We serve our um, prediction output using these um, API layer using their serverless um, Amazon Lambda. And we serve, um, our, uh, we serve our data product to our consumer with these uh, API layer. So our consumer could be either like a web application, uh, web application or application. So after we finish the production of our model, we have to further do the A/B testing of their of our productionized model using their Google Optimize. So this, um, in this step, it, uh, the main purpose is to ensure that um, we are not. Uh, harming but really improve um, their either the revenue or their transaction or conversion rate for our client or a business unit then we get feedback from from business unit and iterate through their problem definition all over again if any improvement is needed or required okay I'm sorry um, for interrupting, but you have like a one minute to conclude your presentation and then we will start the Q&A session for your talk. All right, thank you. And here's are some challenges uh, we ex experience in building our machine learning pipeline implementation in our CTO, apart from building a model. And finally, I will, I will be covering about our future plan to improve our machine learning pipeline here. So um, we plan to uh, serve our model online and uh, as well as having a streaming data pipeline alongside with the online model for serving a more complicated use case of a real-time machine learning or event-driven machine learning model. For instance, um, personalized uh, recommendation based on user events on website or personalized search ranking model. We, it would be nice to uh, have their CICD and uh, alongside with our unit testing into a workflow to speed up our ML uh, pipeline implementation. And we also plan to include a ML experiment control to quickly iterate through the um, uh, model development uh, phase. And finally, um, their post-production monitoring. Yeah. So um, that's the end of my uh, presentation about the ML pipeline we implement at Tops Online. Any question is welcome now. Yeah. So thank you very really much for, for your talk. And this is the last talk of today's. And uh, there is one question. Did you try re-ranking the recommendations model from users picking or selecting behavior? Do you think it will perform better? Um, so right now we are combining the um, purchasing events and the click event from customer, but we prioritize the um, purchase event to be um, higher than the um, click event because it's um, generate revenue, yeah. 
And I also have a question. So how is, how stable is the item embedding? Like, do you have to retain it every like, every week or every month or something like that? So um, for the for the retraining, um, I prepare some data for um, the 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 retraining trigger and the model performance drift just for the search modeling, but um, according to my um, prepared data, based on the search ranking model, uh, I, I have compared um, across a different uh, training period of one month, two, uh, two weeks and one week. So um, their performance in terms of our precision at K are pretty much the same. And, um, for the, but for the recommendation uh, embeddings, um, uh, I may need to invest, investigate um, more time into it, yeah. All right, I think uh, we have to end the talks now. And so we are going to have a speed dating session. Uh, and then we will come back together again for the ending. Okay, so.